So my name is Tanya, and I've been a developer working with game engines for about three years, starting from Unreal Engine uh, from a 3D background. I also have an academic background in political science and cinema studies, so a lot of my work has been very much inspired by those uh, tracks of thought. Um, I uh, actually started doing a lot of visualization work and um, uh, with startup companies, which is one of the slides that you first saw. Uh, and today I'll be talking about basically my ideal game. Uh, the game that I've been building this whole entire time, uh, starting from 2013 as just an idea and a script that I wanted to uh, play around with into something that became Solid State as a demo today. So Solid State is a 3D visual novel about a young woman who must reunite with her friends across ideological divisions as a city-state threatens to uphold, uh, upend in revolt and despotism. You play as Chloe, a woman of, who can craft many ideas through hacking, who gets caught up in a journey of dissent, deception, and redemption that involves citizens from all walks of life. Uh, so gameplay-wise, as you saw in the trailer, you're finding textual puzzles that you read as you scroll through perspective 3D and isometric hacking sequences. And uh, one of the things that I want to talk about today is actually um, a kind of unusual direction that I take with gameplay development. A lot of people start off with uh, game mechanics, for example, first. Um, others would uh, uh, focus more on fun. Um, for me, I focused much more on political theory that drove this game forward uh, to creating both the design and narrative. And I wanted to share this uh, emerging discussion as well as the intersection of all of these fields. So it started from a need to witness socio-political changes and an emo emotional and engaging story. And this is why I got started with uh, Solid State. Um, I had a desire to create conversation about political philosophy that is not closed-ended, but it's an ethics that is not necessarily just about good or bad binaries. Um, I also have a great love of art and design that articulates difficult, unsolvable questions. And so to have multiple seeds of interpretation, not just one prescriptive direction. And I think I can really thank my cinema study direction for this. So for me, I started, as I said, not from game mechanics, but from an experiential and artistic premise of political philosophy. My me game mechanics became crucial to articulating this political philosophy because it's about an ecology of conversations. Uh, I have a new art style that articulates characters in a mockumentary style much better, and the stuff that you see now uh, on the screenshot um, actually presents the game idea uh, much better to me. Uh, we uh, actually converted to uh, I brought in a 2D artist, actually, uh, who is uh, skilled in fine arts, um, used Conte uh, in order to illustrate a kind of almost caricature of the real, and therefore moved into a slightly different um, reference rather than necessarily using a cartoony style or a graffiti art style, which you saw in the trailer. Uh, so I combined these visual novel dialogue conventions with other modes of articulating how a citizen can engage with the space. So how do conversations begin? For me, um, I want this game to be about a search for political identities. And so I engage with books, with art, and with listening to others. It came out of a project where I started by traveling a lot and therefore asked uh, a lot of questions about people's values, especially what they thought about their uh, sense of governance, impo uh, imposition on their lives, or lack thereof. I wanted to ask these questions across generational lines, asking about hopes and dreams, both familiar and unfamiliar, to my own background. A lot of these stories of fear of the hegemonic takeover and of an existing way of life actually have many universal and timeless elements, but they also have a specificity in locality. These stories are also accessible, not necessarily requiring much academic specialization. So my ex uh, existence, at least to me, uh, I identify excuse me, as that of in a di diasporic space. So I'm naturally in a state of becoming. There's a youthful curiosity about this uh, and the vitality about it in questioning one's place in the world that I really wanted to focus on. Of course, within that imaginary space, uh, there's also that of the inverse of not just the utopia, but that of its inverse into nightmares. So um, I wanted to run with this idea of the 
uh, youthful gossip, the idea that despots can be something monstrous, or the wonders of coming together as youth that can coincide with the idea of peaceful protests with rock concerts, making peaceful protests fun. So therefore, what grew out of this exploration uh, is a speculative sci-fi that draws an in-between liminal imagined city space. So uh, the name Solid State is actually a kind of tongue-in-cheek idea. Uh, there is no final identity. There is no final state or solace. This is something where the title is uh, for uh, almost uh, teasing at everyone who's attempting to build the perfect utopia. In post-structuralist thought, utopia is kind of a post, uh, uh, sorry, a hopeless preposition that sets itself up for the fall. Uh, it gives little room for socio-maneuverability by projecting into a far-off goal of having all of its problems solved. Inherently, it's a very closed system, and one where many arguments can hope to bring it down. So my political philosophy is uh, that is at the backbone of solid state is from the critical theorists of the 1960s to 70s known as post-structuralist. This is a term that's given by some of the American theorists upon that of the continental thinkers. Um, uh, for example, Deleuze, who's characterized as this, he himself calls himself a pure metaphysician. And the reason why I bring this up is because the post-structuralists, oops, I'm so sorry, let's go back. Um, they actually uh, move beyond just um, the existing dualism or uh, grand theory of everything that we often associate with things such as um, Descartes with the mind-body separation or that of the Marxist mode of economic production as being the core root of political systems. Instead, post-structuralism actually looks at multiplicities. So if you see that image um, with the root system, you can characterize this as being opposed to that of a tree system where there's one seed that branches off to create um, all of the other ideas. Instead, this one being a kind of fungus or grass uh, root system actually articulates a lot of different entry and exit points. And so what happens here is that you can have many different established connections where organizations of power and hierarchy are interchangeable. So what does this mean? Change, political change, can be seen not just as symptomatic of anything wrong with the system, but it is in fact the norm. So there are many entry and exit points where culture, economics, norms, beliefs are manifested and gets diffused. Uh, movements are the norm. Changing your station in life and also your luck is therefore the norm. Anyone can be an outsider or an insider in a given system, uh, depending on what norms they are accessing. So there are many niches, people's minds can change, and so too do their political streaks. So youth can be especially sensitive to this because they are in the stage of finding their own sites of articulation and also their own identities. They can look at existing binaries that authority enforces upon them and find it wanting. They can find it frustrating that it misunderstands their take on life, their social networks, for example, and they want to access a different kind of relationship with it and create their own constructs of power. They're trying to find their places of belonging. So what does this actually mean within the game itself? I've talked a little bit about the theory and how it might uh, kind of access this uh, type of narrative. But what this actually looks like in the game is I created, as you saw in the trailer, a kind of isometric sequence where you're uh, moving beyond um, just the usual way of looking. So I also use many different camera angles within solid state to rearticulate our relationship to an urban space. So too, characters are framed at different sizes from long shot to close up in gameplay. So there, it creates an uncertainty of who is watching whom. From a first person mode, it seems clear that you're doing a lot of the watching in conventional video game conven um, ideas and that all of the rest of the NPCs are being looked at uh, and they have less sight lines than you. But when this is interrupted in the hacking sequence with the isometric camera, um, this actually transformed the ex a sense of existing hierarchies and therefore created an uncertainty of the uniform gaze. Things are happening outside of the frame of the game that speaks to other conversations. So too, characters are framed at different sizes from the really small image that you see to the larger one that you saw in the conversation. And this leads to a breaking of the social hierarchy so that the weakest can inform the whole frame and the most powerful can be articulated by absence and architectural structures. 
And so this is how Solid State starts, for example. I'll just tell you a little bit of the, the game narrative. I'll be jumping back and forth between these three elements. As Chloe enters into a city as a foreigner, there's a scandal that's happening with the corporation uh, that fills the legislature with its own authority that puts the entire school neighborhood under a militia lockdown. And even though the people can see smoke piling to the sky, so the more people ask questions, they're more, uh, the more that they're being drawn into trumped up charges and jailed. And so uh, other students and community leaders have to find an alternate way of communicating, but also tell stories so that their spirits don't break. Narratives of resistance can exist in pranks, satire, and comics, and in hacking the conventional script. And there are many revolutionary movements throughout history that include students and youth. Movements that are nonviolent can create the most diverse outcomes because they aren't so easy to pin down to one ideology uh, or one party. This can expand much more easily outwards to a new configuration of civic society. So that's what I want to explore the most. It's not necessarily a nonviolent game because I wanted to talk about uh, what's uh, unreasonable uh, and institutionally sanctioned upon uh, as violence done to citizens, including during times of relative peace. But at the same time, uh, from the research that I've done, I want to explore nonviolent movements because they're the ones that bring in the most diverse people as well as to create the most diverse outcomes. So not everyone can necessarily fight with their bodies or with an AK-47. However, there are people who can fight using their words, using song, using dance, using their popularity, and even in exchanging food and offering food and shelter to others. These are the individuals that I want to focus on, but oftentimes in a productive for, uh, uh, this is a productive force of work that is not often recorded in history. These are individuals who are not shown as individuals with motivations, but often as a monolithic collective. So the desire to witness the truth can be a dangerous phenomena to certain structures as well, to certain despots. The idea of gossip as conversation can be very subversive. But at the same time, the act of witnessing and gossip can be playful, and I really want to emphasize this, can be comedic like graffiti and block parties and like skate parks and online sites of sharing. Beyond merely the sum of social interaction, they have the latent ability to transform landscapes, mediascapes, and economies, all our iterative organic processes. Uh, I'm drawn to this contrast, the two sides of the same coin, and it has a lot to do with the architectural space as well as whether spaces are closed off or open to interpretation of the subjects within it. It goes against the idea that one space is built for one person or one group of person. It goes against the idea of silencing others through architecture. It allows a repositioning of economic, social, and political privilege, especially for children and youth. Politics of affect is about the openness to change, and this is one of the core ideas that I wanted to focus on with my game. It's about simultaneously affecting others and being affected. That's basically the, uh, the idea behind it. Uh, this simple concept actually has a lot of implications because it indicates an openness to the world with a lot of entry and exit points. For example, youth are traditionally ignored in the construction of history in terms of actual productive forces rather than reactive ones, whether or not they take a significant part of the demographic. Thus. I wanted to open this question, can we talk about multi-generational multi-general, uh, historicity and complicity in civic space? One of my main characters is a hacker named Torrent, and he is really disenfranchised with the uh, uncanny and uh, just, he doesn't really have a relationship with his overworked parents uh, who are kind of absentee parents. But over time, because he explores the city and gets to know a lot of voices with Chloe, um, he actually changes the way that he communicates. And so this is an ongoing kind of uh, creation of new sites of meaning and understanding with their mutual roles in society. And it's an all in between process. The characters in Saul Estate want to be free from despotism of civil violence in different ways. However, my narrative will have an underlying philosophy of what this freedom means. I echo Masumi in his statement that freedom is not about breaking or escaping constraints, it's about flipping them over to degrees of um, freedom. It involves tweaking uh, the interference and resonation patterns uh, between individuals. It's a relational undertaking. Oops, sorry, I keep on pressing the next slide. Uh, where an, a measure of indeterminacy uh, creeps in. So solid state isn't necessarily about freeing oneself from advanced capitalism or any of these uh, particular structures um, or neo-Marxism, uh, but instead it's 
less about power over and more power to. So that's the idea behind politics of affect. Um, and it's about how our uh, political identity formation actually is from the actualization of power through our behavior, through our talk, through our gestures, and also also through our shared myths. And because of this, um, we can't necessarily just talk about one certain kind of hegemonic group in this way. So how does this actually look like in game? Uh, how do I actually uh, change my game design to actualize on this kind of image of uh, a very abstract notion of philosophy and political theory? Well, uh, in the game, as you saw in the hacking sequence, uh, I ch that I chose, you can basically never see everything at once. It's a 3D liminal space where politically there are, uh, it's an articulation of where politically you can never know everything all at once. So for example, Chloe can only piece things together um, even though she's a hacker par excellence, she has a kind of x-ray vision, but it only gets her so far. She also has to share co uh, conversations with the characters around her in order to grow as a character, as a human being. Uh, she can't just pretend uh, to create a script on her own um, to actualize that. Politically, there are limitations to that access of knowledge in order to make the most rational choice. But in this case, um, the 3D objects are often on screen simultaneously. They're all over overlapping, forming a kind of pastiche, a suggestion that there's layers upon layers of history unfolding like a book. What happens on one layer can affect all the other layers. So I want to break from this notion of the player to protagonist, which is often always given like a near omniscience. We associate that a lot with first person, third person shooters um, and uh, other adventure titles uh, where violence is prevalent and um, where I believe uh, in a way it's presenting a utopic idea, it's a, presenting a fantasy, which can often actually flip the script into uh, degrees or tonality of nightmares, uh, or its inverse, a dystopia. So I wanted a different perspective when Chloe's hacking so that it doesn't really rely on that existing convention and aesthetic of power. It will form a different kind of readership and a habit. So the 3D space, of course, is naturally playful. It asks to be explored, for it to be lighted in different ways, for things to be scaled and rotated. So it lends itself well to the idea of witnessing and gossip and conversation. In solid state, the hacking has built in points of interruption through text and intersecting imagery. The environment keeps transitioning and intersecting between the periphery and the center, creating a kind of in-betweenness. The politics of affect with its openness and multiplicity of many uh, entry and exit points is an optimistic imagery for open internet, open digitality, and open source. So the theory of solid state must reference that sci-fi impulse. So um, I'm almost done. I just wanted to finish off with the politics of emotion, which the politics of affect is very closely tied to because it allows this kind of relational uh, idea of not just rationality, but also of feeling. So stories with identity formations are emotional processes and can be challenging to portray effectively. One way is to write character dialogue to draw allegories from personal interaction and personal artifacts to the society writ large and also vice versa. For example, Torrent, one of the main male characters, would talk about local foods and it's referential to a way of life and also of economic production. Another way is through the portrayal of emotion as shared by the public and their urban tales and gossip. Anger in the politics of affect is interruptive but so too is humor, laughter, and all these joyous th events. So the shared urban uh, stories encapsulate collective feelings of fear versus hope, disorientation versus belonging, shame versus pride, in a manner that is enacted, contested, and reacted to uh, unevenly within society. For example, certain characters may find themselves more sensitive to fear that projects them into an uncertain future, and this is something that Heidegger has talked about, depending on their perceived socioeconomic stability, as well as the urban mythology that they themselves have access to within their social circle. Beyond using character expressions in my game as per conventional visual novel conventions, uh, I will also use lighting to articulate motions within a shared urban space, lighting that can move, for example, depending on where you are in the game world. The use of color in 3D prose processing and lighting will help me articulate the process, uh, politics of emotion. The form of architecture itself can demonstrate social mood, such as the use of softer curves versus angular, brutalist architecture. Text is also affected by size, scale, and color and positioning in the 3D world in order to show its emotional resonance.
And this is really taking advantage of what a 3D engine can offer me versus, for example, a 2D engine. But there is a lot of cross-fertilization of emotion in the pub, uh, political spaces. Sometimes it takes an intrusion, such as in the form of Chloe, who is making her false IDs through her digital hacking. And her, de uh, her hacking and ID crafting still leaves her an imperfect actor. So it, it, it only seeks to interrupt and reorient the way that others, such as the locals, uh, communicate and address each other. Other intrusions, such as corporate rights, trumping common citizen rights, can show us that people can take some old comforts granted. So I am at peace with the act of walking backwards, examining political identities, e examining these formations. I think it's necessary to have that reminder of having a sense of intermingling ideologies, not necessarily just one, especially for youth who are just being exposed to it and don't quite always buy it and often react to it with feelings and emotions. I want to articulate human stories and then internal contradictions in this way as they're constantly being transforming and transformative, always affecting and being affected. Thank you.